you're into learning, self-improvement, and podcasts, you probably know Andrew Huberman. His show has skyrocketed to the top five globally in multiple categories like science, education, health, and fitness in just the last four years. But what if I told you that when it comes to ADHD, Andrew Huberman might be getting some things very, very wrong. Leaving out essential details, oversimplifying key concepts, and even straight up spreading inaccuracies that could be incredibly harmful to our community. So. In this video, I'll break down Huberman's most popular ADHD episode and reveal what he gets right and wrong about ADHD, what stigma and misunderstanding he spreads about medication and other treatments, and whether his advice even works for those of us living with ADHD, ADHD, and how anyone can improve their focus. Today, we are going to talk all about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, normal levels of focus, and how all of us can improve our ability to focus, rule out distraction, as well as remember information better. Many of us have constellations of symptoms that make us somewhat like somebody with ADHD because of stress, because of smartphone use, which turns out can induce adult ADHD. We'll talk about that. That's not true. Wow. We'll get back to that one in a bit. Andrew tells you what ADHD stands for, when it was first described, and how it's inherited in the family. He does not, however, tell you what ADHD actually is. Some symptoms, yes. Some science, yes, but no proper definition. ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder with impairing levels of inattention, disorganization, and hyperactivity impulsivity. What's a disorder? Basically, a disruption in the normal functions of the body or the mind that has a significant impact on someone's daily life. Neurodevelopmental just means it affects the nervous system, including the brain. Inattention and disorganization can include things like difficulty staying on tasks, not listening to people, losing things beyond what's considered normal for somebody's age, and hyperactivity can be things like excessive fidgeting, trouble sitting still, or interrupting others. These are the official definitions from the diagnostic manual that psychiatrists use. I guess Andrew thought these definitions were obvious, but we'll use them to evaluate the quality of his claims and make sure we're all on the same page. So for example, when he says, there are ways to overcome those symptoms of lack of attention, impulsivity, and so on. You could go, but how do you overcome your brain development? If you're over 25, you really can't do much to change it. So having someone tell you that you will overcome your symptoms sounds a bit ableist, but let's use that as a segue to my very first argument. Andrew Huberman misrepresents and trivializes ADHD in a way that is actively harmful for everyone involved. I mean, it's in the subtlety of the language he's used so far. The title, the smartphones give you ADHD. You can overcome your symptoms. Anyone can focus, anyone can overcome this. Maybe you're just on your smartphone too much. Does that make you feel validated or understood? If your boss, your parents, your teacher watch this, do you think they would give you accommodations and understanding for your ADHD? Or do you think they would tell you to try harder and just focus because you can overcome your symptoms if you really, really want to? This you can do it attitude might sound positive, but it's actually really harmful to the ADHD community. Case in point. It has nothing to do with intelligence. Being ADHD doesn't necessarily mean that you have a low IQ. So there are people with ADHD who have low IQs, people with ADHD with high IQs, people with ADHD with high emotional IQ or with low IQ in the emotional scale. Your ability to attend and focus does not relate to how smart you are. Sounds good, right? We are just as smart as everyone else. However, there is research to show that ADHDers actually score seven to 10 points lower on IQ tests, mostly due to struggles with the testing methods like getting distracted, forgetting questions, and making careless mistakes. When they filter out these mistakes, you could say that we're just as smart because we are, but you also have to make one important conclusion. If you test and evaluate ADHD years by neurotypical standards, they can appear to be less smart and capable. But if their struggles are acknowledged and compensated with the appropriate accommodations and understanding, they are actually able to perform like everyone else. Andrew doesn't mention that. He just says we are just as smart, but that's not going to get us accommodations. Further. So right now, the current estimates are that about one in 10 children and probably more have ADHD. You know, the specific numbers vary, but please stop saying children. It's not just children. I mean, he mentions adults later, but he's extremely children first in this whole episode. Fortunately, about half of those will resolve with proper treatment, but the other half typically don't. I don't know where he got the numbers since 
he cites only three studies for this entire two and a half hour episode, but most studies say that only about 20% of people grow out of their ADHD because their brain develops differently to a point where their symptoms are no longer severe enough to be classified as a disorder. He also says that proper treatment resolves the ADHD in those 50% of cases, which Andrew, most of the world does not even diagnose, let alone have proper treatment for us. Heck, even the US has a medication shortage, so not everyone even there can get proper treatment. And there are so few psychiatrists too. My coaches have to wait for years to get diagnosed. He doesn't mention that. Instead, he goes on. The other thing that we are seeing a lot nowadays is increased levels of ADHD in adults. And there's some question as to whether or not those adults had ADHD that went undetected during their childhood or whether or not ADHD is now cropping up in adulthood due to the way that we are interacting with the world. Smartphone use, the combination of email, text, real world interactions, multiple apps and streams of media and social media. No, you can't get a neurodevelopmental disorder from stress or scrolling on TikTok. You can get temporary symptoms that somewhat resemble those of ADHD, but they are temporary. They can be fixed. But his worst misrepresentation is how he explains hyperfocus. You might think that people with ADHD just simply can't attend to anything. They really can't focus, even if they really want to. But that's simply not the case. People with ADHD can have a hyper-focus, an incredible ability to focus on things that they really enjoy or are intrigued by. If you give them something they really love, like if the child loves video games, or if a child loves to draw, or if an adult loves a particular type of movie or a person very much, they will obtain laser focus without any effort. This is a harmful and wrong misconception that way too many people believe. Hyperfocus is not the opposite of poor attention. And we don't even have poor attention. We struggle to control our attention. So when we're skipping from one distraction to the next, we're struggling to control our attention. And when we are focused on one single thing and we cannot remove our focus for anything or anyone else, we struggle to control our attention. In both cases, we're not in control of our attention. But distractions get all the bad press and hyperfocus is somehow incredible. An incredible ability to focus. Until you look under the hood. Because hyperfocus can be exhausting. It can burn you out for several days and it often produces lower quality work. It can cause you to ignore all of your bodily needs and it's nothing to strive for and glorify. Also, you can hyperfocus on anything and it has less to do with how much fun it is and way more to do with how much energy you have, how easy it is to start doing the thing and get in the flow, etc. So Andrew's idea that hyperfocus only comes from fun and interest is not only wrong, it has some dangerous implications. So that tells us that people with ADHD have the capacity to attend, but they can't engage that attention for things that they don't really, really want to do. And as we all know, much of life, whether or not you're a child or an adult, involves doing a lot of things that we don't want to do. If you can't focus at work or school, you probably think it's boring. Please stop. I don't want people's bosses and teachers to hear that and think that we're some kind of hedonistic dopamine junkies you always need to keep hooked. It's an oversimplification of how ADHD works and it brings me right to my next point. Andrew Huberman oversimplifies ADHD and adds little nuance in a way that can be easily misunderstood and harmful to our community. People with ADHD often run late. They often procrastinate. But what's interesting and surprising is that if they are given a deadline, they actually can perceive time very well. And they often can focus very well if the consequences of not completing a task or not attending are severe enough. But Andrew, even if deadlines and pressure work for us, who wants to live in constant stress? What's the point of mentioning that? The way that people with ADHD can really focus if they like something, well, if they're scared enough about the consequences of not attending, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes they can attend. But people with ADHD have challenges understanding how to line up the activities of their day in order to meet particular deadlines. Yes, that's part of our executive dysfunction. But Andrew never mentions executive dysfunction in an episode about ADHD. Other symptoms include... Challenges with attention and focus, challenges with impulse control, they get annoyed easily, they have kind of an impulsivity, they can't stay on task, time perception can be off, they use the piling system or a system that doesn't work well for them, and they have a hard time with anything that's mundane that they're not really interested in. But again, I just want to highlight that people with ADHD are able to obtain heightened levels of focus, even hyper-focus, for things that are exciting to them and that they really want to engage in. So now you have the contour of what ADHD is. And if you're somebody who doesn't have ADHD, you should also be asking yourself which aspects of ADHD are similar to things I've experienced before. In 23 minutes, he gave a random list of symptoms and a subpar definition. 
I think if he actually wanted to help people understand ADHD, he should have gone deeper into the root causes of the problems and helped people recognize and acknowledge our struggles. Maybe even advocated for some appropriate accommodations and support. He doesn't do that. Then Andrew Huberman explains the neuroscience of ADHD. Technologies like the smartphone put us at greater risk of developing ADHD at all ages. Wait. <laughs> No. Then Andrew Huberman explains the neuroscience of ADHD and it's all about dopamine. Dopamine, 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 a dopamine system, dopamine release, dopamine, dopamine, dopamine hypothesis. With this dopamine, dopaminergic dopamine release can allow a person, whether or not they have ADHD or not, to direct their attention to particular things in their environment. He talks a lot about dopamine, specifically not having enough of it. But scientists still don't fully understand how ADHD works. The problem might involve lower levels of dopamine, but it could also be the sensitivity of the dopamine receptors, the number of receptors, or even how efficiently the dopamine is used. It might be a combination of all of these factors. And it's not even just all about dopamine. There's norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, and cortisol. They also play significant roles in the neuroscience of ADHD. Why is most of this episode just low dopamine, poor attention, no focus until like one hour and 45 minutes in. And even then, he doesn't give you all the nuance that I just mentioned. My next argument is personally the most painful one to me. Andrew Huberman presents ADHD medication in an insensitive, biased, and negative way, which deepens the existing stigma and misunderstandings around it and has harmful effects on the people who rely on their medication to function. Both claim, I know, but you have to hear me out. He starts by explaining how ADHDers have always had a tendency to self-medicate with coffee, nicotine, sugar, street drugs, etc., and how that can reduce some of our symptoms. When somebody with ADHD takes that drug, it turns out they actually obtain heightened levels of focus. Likewise, children who consume anything that increases their levels of dopamine, if those children have ADHD, they tend to be calmer. They tend to be able to focus more. I'm happy that he noted and made that distinction between how ADHDers and neurotypical people use and react to these substances. He says this knowledge helped us create ADHD medication based on amphetamine, for example, that works in a similar way and helps people improve their symptoms symptoms, but he does not make it clear that this medication is also fundamentally different from the amphetamine that you find on the street. In fact, he continuously groups the two together. Ritalin, also called methylphenidate, is very similar to amphetamine, speed. Some of you probably realize this, that Adderall is amphetamine, but I'm guessing that there are a good number of you out there, perhaps even parents and kids, that don't realize that these drugs like cocaine and amphetamine, methamphetamine, which are incredibly dangerous and incredibly habit forming and have high potential for abuse. Well, the pharmaceutical versions of those are exactly what are used to treat ADHD. Now, they're not exactly like cocaine or methamphetamine, but they are structurally and chemically very similar. And their net effect in the brain and body is essentially the same, which is to increase dopamine. So what I'm essentially saying is that the drugs that are used to treat ADHD are stimulants. In fact, nearly identical to some of the so-called street drug stimulants that we all hear are so terrible. The distinction between drugs of abuse and the distinction between drugs of treatment is actually a very fine and sometimes even a blurry line. He opens the topic by asking a fellow researcher specializing in ADHD and epilepsy about their opinion on medication. What did he ask, you say? First of all, I asked, what do you think about giving young kids amphetamine? I'm sorry, what? Does the doctor think of giving young kids amphetamine? Hopefully nothing good, but weren't you supposed to ask what do you think of giving people with ADHD amphetamine-based, but also other types of stimulant medication? Their answer was, on the face of it, it seems crazy, but provided the lowest possible doses used, modulated as they grow older and develop those powers of attention, their observation was that they've seen more kids benefit than not benefit from that. How is it crazy? It's the standard approved medication for this condition for decades. Kind of sounds like it's a hit or miss when it's really not. Sure, it's hard to find the right medication for every person and the right dose, but once you have that, once you've worked through the initial side effects, there are not many negative effects in the literature. There are, however, an overwhelming amount of positive effects that can hugely improve people's lives, especially kids, because they can still rewire their brain with the help of the medication, and you can spare them so much struggle in the future with that. More kids benefit than not, it's just not how I describe it. No, I'm certainly not saying what people should do. You obviously have to go to a doctor if you're considering giving Ritalin or Adderall or any type of stimulant to your child, of course. What could be more important than the health of your child?
it feels a bit dramatic. This whole discussion, the way that it's packaged, the angles that he takes. People are already very judgmental about ADHD medication. They see it as drugs. They think it's unfair. Parents are scared to give it to their kids. And this is how he opens the discussion. I do want to emphasize that at the appropriate dosages and working with a quality psychiatrist, neurologist, or family physician, many people with ADHD achieve excellent relief with these drugs. Not all of them, but many of them do, especially if these treatments are started early in life. I hope that's not too little too late. I also want to acknowledge that many people out there, many, many people out there, are taking these drugs even though they have not been clinically diagnosed with ADHD. When I say these drugs, I'm specifically referring to Ritalin and Adderall. And, and we're back to feeding the stigma. Up to 25% of college students, and perhaps as many as 35% of all individuals between the ages of 17 and 30, are taking Adderall on a regular or semi-regular basis in order to work, in order to study, and in order to function and focus in their daily life, even though they have not been diagnosed with ADHD. There's a whole black market for this. They're getting it from people with prescriptions. I'm not here to pass judgment. I just want to emphasize how these drugs work and how they can be very detrimental in other individuals. So he starts talking about people without ADHD abusing our medication and throws out these massive numbers without even mentioning that this data is specific to the US if it's even accurate at all. Aren't scientists supposed to be precise and avoid leaving so much open to interpretation? I mean, this podcast is in the top five globally. So any house here in Germany could be like, oh my God, 30% of the people in the world abuse ADHD medication. We should ban it. Even though it's super hard to get our medication in Germany and in some countries, it's nearly impossible or even illegal to access it. Leaving out details like this is a manipulative way of telling a story. And in an episode that's supposed to be for ADHD years, he goes on with Adderall use and Ritalin use without diagnosis of ADHD was second in incident only to cannabis. But actually now the consumption of Adderall without prescription is higher than the consumption of cannabis in that age group. There's a lot of stimulant use. And his story of how he took ADHD medication one time and concludes I personally would not want to be in that state for sake of studying or learning or for doing this podcast, for instance. I'm not on any of the compounds that I've described during the course of today's episode. But you're neurotypical. How is this relevant to the ADHD discussion? And you know what's worse? The paper is Esposito et al., Frontiers in Biosciences. It's an excellent, excellent review of the entire literature. It's not an excellent review. And it refers to these drugs in an interesting way. It doesn't just refer to these drugs as for treatment of ADHD. It actually refers to them using language that ordinarily I'm not very fond of, but I'll agree to here, which is so-called smart drugs or nootropics. So he'll agree with this language. He chose this study out of all the massive studies on ADHD medication out there. I think you can really tell where his opinion of ADHD medication lays. But why was the study not an excellent review? What's wrong with the one single study that Andrew Huberman cited 10 million people on this ADHD medication episode? For one, it's called smart drugs and neuroenhancement. What do we know? And it's not a study of ADHDers, but people who take our smart drugs, but also they themselves write, most of the studies we reviewed were surveys. One was a prospective longitudinal study, one was a crossover study, and one was an experimental study in an animal model on rats. So there were two high quality studies in this review. Two, surveys are biased and low quality scientific data. There are literally medication studies on whole populations, like everybody in Sweden, everybody in Denmark. But this medication abuse review with mostly service data and a dismissive title is what Andrew Huberman calls excellent and wants you to know about. <sighs> What I like about this review so much is that in putting these drugs of abuse, methamphetamine and cocaine, right alongside these drugs like Ritalin and Adderall, we start to realize that the distinction between drugs of abuse and the distinction between drugs of treatment is actually a very fine and sometimes even a blurry line. That's what you liked about it? Then he outright fabricates facts about the side effects of medication that are so dangerously wrong, I could not believe my ears. In thinking about whether or not one wants to use these prescription, I want to emphasize prescription, not drugs of abuse, but prescription drugs for treatment of one's own attentional capacity, I think it is important to understand the extent to which they all carry more or less the same side effects, such as high propensity for addiction and abuse. No, they don't. When taken as prescribed, which should have been the focus of this episode, ADHD medication is not shown to be addictive. If anything, people like feeling like functional human beings and will miss their medication psychologically if you take it away, but their bodies won't feel deprived. 
the dose is too low to create an instant high and many medications are also slow release so they feel completely different from street drugs there is no high to chase there we just want to get through life without getting run over by a car dude ADHD medication is proven to protect us from abusing the dangerous street drugs that Andrew so loves talking about. He never mentions that. So saying the opposite is not only wrong, but dangerous. And it could push people right back into their actual unhealthy addictions just to avoid taking their medication. Most side effects wear off within a few months, as long as people are receiving the ideal medication and dose for them. In addition, they almost all carry cardiac effects, right? They increase heart rate, but they also have effects on constriction of blood vessels and arteries and veins and so forth in ways that can create cardiovascular problems. But having ADHD alone is a big risk factor for heart conditions. And studies have shown that with long-term use, the healthy lifestyle changes ADHDers make on medication lead to much better health outcomes for them. Outcomes that far outweigh any potential negative side effects. And I say potential because there are studies that support both slightly negative effects for the heart and no negative effects whatsoever. Either way, the long-term benefits can be absolutely life-changing in comparison. And you can tell Andrew misunderstands why ADHDers are taking their medication because he says this. Because of the large amounts of dopamine that are released in the brain, people tend to crave that state over and over, and yet with each subsequent use are able to get less and less of that euphoric feeling or that really, really focused feeling. So one thing that's being explored quite extensively now in the treatment of ADHD are drug schedules. Andrew, doctors tell you this when you start your treatment. You might be a little more euphoric and motivated in the beginning, but that's not the ultimate goal of the medication. The goal is to create a baseline level of functioning that you can always rely on so you can handle your daily life. That's their intended way of functioning. If you would have actually interviewed an ADHD person, maybe you would know. It's hard for neurotypicals to imagine. I get it. They think it's all about focus. Now, by taking a drug, it's creating focus artificially. It's not creating focus because they're super interested in something. It does not create focus artificially. It can't make you do stuff you hate. It gives you back the executive functioning that could help you decide to do that. It's not magical focus. It's chemically inducing a state of focus. And you stop. So just taking a drug and expecting focus to just work at any point and being able to turn focus on and off at will, that's an unrealistic expectation. That's not what we expect. We know you don't get it. Just please stop spreading your stigma to other people. My next point is that Andrew Huberman presents some harmful and ableist notions about ADHD that dismiss and trivialize our struggles. And I'm going to share with you a tool for which there are terrific research data that will allow you in a single session to enhance your ability to focus in theory forever. Okay, but if it were that easy, wouldn't we all be cured by now? And what do you suggest anyway? You can use panoramic vision to access the state that we call open monitoring. When people do that, they are able to attend to and recognize multiple targets. How are we supposed to be focused enough to remember that these hacks even exist? As someone with ADHD and an ADHD coach, I can tell you we won't. There is so much groundwork that needs to be laid there first in order for this to work. And you know what's especially helpful? medication that helps you build the groundwork then the hacks could work sometimes there have also been studies done where people were taught to think in a particular way for a very short period of time and that forever changed their ability to limit or reduce the number of these attentional blinks so like just stop being depressed our brain is the source of the problem i don't think neurotypicals fully understand how little you can rely on your brain fixing the problem that it's also creating. There are now published accounts in the literature of a simple practice done for about 15 minutes where subjects were asked to just sit quietly, eyes closed, and do what is sort of akin to meditation, but to not direct their mind into any particular state or place. I think most of us could handle one meditation session of 17 minutes or so. And so if ever there was a tool that stood to rewire our attentional circuitry in a powerful way, this seems to be it. Wow. He spends more time explaining these random exercises than he actually spends on ADHD or ADHD medication. Children with ADHD, adults with ADHD, or people with normal levels of focus that want to improve their ability to focus can do so through a training that involves learning how often to blink and when and how to keep their visual focus on a given target. And he really thinks we can apply all of these hacks because we are as aware of ourselves as everyone else. If we were to just focus on it. 
it's important to understand that people with ADHD are in touch with how they feel. It's really a question of whether or not they can take the demands that are placed upon them and enter a cognitive state, a mental state that allows them to access the information they need to access. In other words, whether or not they can focus. But we're effectively not as self-aware as everyone else because we usually don't focus on it. It's kind of like the IQ study. If you ignore all of the ADHD factors, we're just like everyone else. It's giving ableism. Combine those treatments with behavioral exercises that actively engage the very circuits that you're trying to train up and enhance. And then perhaps, I want to highlight perhaps, tapering off those drugs so that then one can use those circuits without any need for chemical intervention. And most adults don't even have the time or understanding to try to retrain their brains. They can use their medication to change their lives and maybe that's all they can afford to do for their ADHD. I know it's not optimal, but it is realistic. This feels like he's giving people false hope and discrediting medication without having a proper proven alternative to suggest to them, at least to me. And I'll show you that it had a similar effect on other viewers when we go through some of his comments. But my last argument is that Andrew Huberman focused way too heavily on random treatments with little effect or insufficient scientific background instead of established methods of treating ADHD like medication, coaching, and therapy. He talks at length about avoiding sugar and eating omega-3s, which yes, it's very helpful, but the effects are barely noticeable, especially in severe cases. And then he suggests a bunch of legal and even illegal supplements. Racetams are illegal in certain countries. They are gray market in other countries and they are sold over the counter in this country, in the US. Different margins for safety. You definitely need to consult your doctor, especially if you have ADHD. Supplements are an unregulated industry in the US and in other places and the quality of what you're getting can vary greatly. That's hardly a reliable solution for everyone. So before you go out and spend a bunch of money on them, you could also try zapping your brain first with transcranial magnetic stimulation. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, also called TMS, it is a non-invasive tool. It involves taking a coil, it's a device with a coil that's placed over particular locations in the brain and then sends magnetic stimulation into the brain. It can actually pass through the skull without having to drill through the skull. And nowadays can be used to both lower the amount of activity or increase the amount of activity in specific brain areas. Guys, there's barely any science on this. So they're literally teaching the brain to learn in a non-invasive way, no drug at all. Because zapping your brain with magnetic waves and making it react to them is not invasive. I mean, what are you afraid of? It's only your entire personality, knowledge, and memories of life in there. Try some experimental treatments. At least it's not street drugs. Should you trust Andrew Huberman's takes on ADHD? Based on this specific video, I would not recommend it. He didn't explain our symptoms in depth or present the actual experience of living with ADHD. Instead, he leaned heavily on his idea of what our problems are, some personal anecdotes, and whatever casual conversations he had with other experts. And the studies he cited were not really excellent. But his takes on medication and treatments is what struck me the most. They felt biased for scientists, especially the whole street drug situation. And where did he read that medication has a high propensity for addiction and abuse? I just don't know. He also made little mention of therapy and coaching and instead focused on blinking 17 minute meditations and questionable supplements. Oh, and zapping. Don't forget the brain zapping. And it worked too. Just read some of these comments. Actionable items from the video without medication. Reduced sugar consumption, rapid blinking to increase dopamine and do work, eating stuff with omega-3 fatty acids, and meditate with your closed eyes or dilated vision. Blink, meditate, don't eat sugar. 8,400 likes. If this solved ADHD, then I am a fish without ADHD. Being a 58 year old with ADHD on Adderall for longer than I like. This really opened my eyes to all that I never knew. I hope you're not ashamed of your medication, sir, because it sounds like it and you really shouldn't have to be. Having ADHD is tough, but it can be a superpower if harnessed correctly. No. And the one that makes all of my points for me. Having untreated ADHD and listening to this, trying to learn to fix yourself is challenging. I listen to each segment so many times. I basically need a dedicated Huberman notebook to take notes. Even when I focus, I can't remember. No, I'm not using cannabis. You're not the problem, Wendy. So many things just don't work before you get medication. And even then, we need the support to be able to improve our lives in any way. It's not going to be the brain zapping. We need all of the other support, the accommodations, the therapy, the coaching, everything. Watch my video 
about the dangers of untreated ADHD to find out just how much treatments like medication and therapy can improve our health, habits, relationships, and even financial situation with ADHD because it's full of studies and citations and you can safely show it to everyone you know to educate them and help them understand what we're actually going through.